Hi, this will be your discussion on pancreatitis. So when I talk about pancreatitis, your pancreatitis is a serious inflammation of the pancreas which can result from the obstruction of the outflow of pancreatic secretions. So again, what happened? Okay, your pancreas is expected to produce enzymes. Common to, is, uh, common to us is your amylase and lipase. It says here that the inflammation of the pancreas is resulting from the obstruction of the outflow of these pancreatic secretions. What do we mean by that? If your amylase and lipase is unable to go out of your pancreas okay, because of the obstruction, let's say for example, there's a stone there, the amylase and lipase may return to your pancreas or may oversaturate your pancreas in such a way that autolysis will again occur. Okay? With that, your pancreas will be destroyed. Okay? In other words, it's amylase and lipase destroying its own pancreas. Now, this can result to edema, necrosis, and even hemorrhage. What are the possible causes of this? One is biliary disease. So it's possible that your cholecystitis, cholelithiasis may complicate towards the pancreas or the sequelae of your stone in your common bile duct okay, may also obstruct that of the flow to, from the pancreas. Also, your excessive alcohol intake, which triggers the release of the substances, amylase and lipase. Your hyperlipidemia, which triggers the increase in the release of your lipase. Your gallstones. Pancreatic trauma and certain medications, and then familial predisposition. Uh, your pancreatitis has been traditionally referred to as your bangungot. Okay? The sudden death is your pancreatitis. Then, there are different classifications. The classifications of this is based on the pathological process involved. One is your acute interstitial. So, in your acute interstitial, there is edema and inflammation of the interstitium of your pancreas. This is secondary to other diseases. Then the next type is your acute hemorrhagic. In your acute hemorrhagic, there is diffuse areas of inflammation and hemorrhage. This is also associated with fibrosis and loss of function. Commonly, acute hemorrhagic is associated with prolonged alcohol use. Then we have your chronic pancreatitis. In chronic pancreatitis, there is already histologic alterations of the pancreas. Okay, which becomes a progressive destructive disease. In this type of pancreatitis, the normal tissues are already replaced by connective tissues. Okay, so chronic leads to histologic alterations already, meaning the cellular structure of your pancreas is already changing because of chronic, irrita chronic irritation and exposure to substances. Assessment findings. So in acute pancreatitis, abdominal pain, specifically we're talking about epigastric pain. This tends to be abrupt in onset and then tends to radiate from the left upper quadrant to the back. Then there will be persistent vomiting. And then abdominal distension, fever, epigastric tenderness. Epigastric tenderness is related to the location of your pancreas. Then hypotension and hypovolemia. Although common in acute pancreatitis, hypotension and hypovolemia is more common and prominent in your acute hemorrhagic pancreatitis. Then we also have your positive Vostek and Trousseau sign. If you can recall in fluids and electrolytes, your positive Vostek and Trousseau sign would point towards calcium imbalance. Specifically, this talks about hypocalcemia. Now, how could there be hypocalcemia in a patient with acute pancreatitis? So, references would say that this is secondary to the precipitation of calcium soaps in the abdominal cavity. Okay, so when the lipase or when the free fatty acids, I mean, okay, due to the failure on the part of the lipase, when there are free fatty acids floating around, the tendency is for these free fatty acids to bind with calcium. Okay, making calcium soaps. So insoluble calcium salts combined with your free fatty acids would lead to calcium deposition. They tend to deposit in your retroperitoneum. And with that deposit of your calcium salts, okay, the serum calcium levels are decreased, leading towards your positive Vostek sign and your positive Trousseau sign. Now, try to review what is Vostek sign and what is Trousseau sign, what is characterized by carpopedal spasm and what is characterized by facial muscle twitching or spasms. Then, 
uh, characteristic to your pancreatitis is the increase of your serum, amylase, and lipase. Look at this. In pancreatitis acute, there is increase of both serum and urine amylase, and there is also increase of lipase. So both amylase and lipase here are affected. Calcium levels are decreased. There will also be decrease of your albumin levels. Okay, that's why patient would manifest with fluid volume problems. Hyperglycemia. Okay, insulin will not be working properly because your pancreas is ruined. So hyperglycemia. Decrease in bowel sounds. Okay, then abdominal distension and rigidity. Signaling your peritonitis. Then, patient would manifest with signs of shock, decreased heart rate, decreased pulse, and cold, clammy skin, for that matter. And severe hemorrhagic pancreatitis, other than the signs and symptoms mentioned in the acute, your patient would manifest with Turner sign and then Cullen sign. So, in your Turner sign, okay, your Turner sign is commonly described as okay, the flank hemorrhage. Okay, flank hemorrhage. So, this is your Turner sign. Okay, the one on your right. Your Cullen sign is commonly referred to as your periumbilical ecchymosis. Okay, periumbilical meaning around, around your umbilicus. This is hemorrhagic discoloration of your umbilical area. And uh, both of them are due to intraperitoneal hemorrhage. So among the most common conditions that would cause your intraperitoneal hemorrhage will be your pancreatitis. In chronic pancreatitis, you have acute bouts of abdominal pain with intervals of pain-free periods. So it tends to be recurrent. Okay, there's pain today, no pain tomorrow. Then there is malabsorption. Severe weight loss is occurring. There is statorrhea, which is the presence of your fat in stools. Patient is manifesting with jaundice and fever, vomiting, and then increase of amylase. Take note, prominent here is the increase of your amylase. Diagnostic tests. There are several. One is your ultrasound. Okay, your ultrasound will help identify if indeed there are gallstones blocking the drainage or outflow of your pancreatic secretions. Or maybe to check if there are pancreatic mass or pseudocyst. Your CT scan would check for pancreatic enlargement if there are fluids around the pancreas and perfusion deficits. ERCP. Your ERCP is endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography which can be used okay, to diagnose chronic pancreatitis and to differentiate if the problem is inflammatory only or if there is already fibrosis because of cancer. Then you have your endoscopic ultrasonography. Again, related to the location of your pancreas, which is posterior to your stomach, okay, your endoscopic ultrasonography will be able to detect changes indicative of chronic pancreatitis. Then you have your percutaneous FNAP. FNAB is fine needle aspiration biopsy. So your fine needle aspiration biopsy will be able to identify or differentiate between chronic pancreatitis from cancer of the pancreas. Pancreatic cancer is also becoming more common and its prognosis is actually very poor. So that's why if ever your patient is not responding to PPIs, the usual presentation of this uh, patient's class in the emergency room is that they will present with epigastric pain and then they do not respond to PPIs, your proton pump inhibitors. So that gives us a cue that we need to rule out for your uh, amylase, uh, for your pancreatitis. So for example, I gave patient omeprazole or esomeprazole and then no response after an hour. Okay, and then the patient is still on severe pain. Okay, we are ruling out already pancreatitis. Okay, that is using your amylase and lipase for the diagnostic test. Then, uh, medical management. So, complete bed rest. For pain, may, we may use morphine and meperidin. If you're still talking about the spasm, then of course it's meperidin, which will be your choice. Prophylactic antibiotics are given. Dietary management, of course an NPO, until pain and tenderness have improved. TPN with intralipids, because we're having problem with lipids, with lipase not functioning properly. Then, fluid and electrolyte replacement. We might need calcium gluconate, calcium supplements. Okay? Patient is usually placed on NGT to promote uh, decompression and later on to be used to administer your uh, nutrition. Low-fat diet, if ever your patient will be placed on diet. And of course, no-no to alcohol. 
okay, surgery may be performed if a gallstone was found to be the cause of the pancreatitis. Then, we've touched on your ERCP previously, so it will be the same procedure using your endoscope. The preparation will be the same as preparing the patient for endoscopy. Dear students, this will be the end of the discussion on gastrointestinal system. The next topics will focus already on endocrine system. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I hope that you have learned something from this.